Hello and welcome to the second half of Bowman College's BBC School Report. I'm Jacob. I am Mark. And I am Tyler. Our main headlines from around the duchy today include Donald Trump made night at a round table, English heritage accused of vandalism, and scarlet fever on the rise in Cornwall, and the Bobman beast exposed. And in other news, we will also be covering scandalous young driver insurance, violence in schools, high school dinner costs, and the increase of dead people on Facebook. First up, we are handing over to Tyler, Jake and Harvey at Tintangel Castle, who are interviewing hotel owner John Mappin about why he has decided to make USA President hopeful Donald Trump a knight of the round table of Camelot. Over to you, Tyler. Uh, we're here today to interview John Mappin, the owner of Camelot Hotel, as he has recently made Donald Trump one of the knights of the round table. Uh, so John, why did you make Donald Trump a knight of the round table? Well, you know, we saw the work that he was doing for veterans in the United States, and from our point of view, it's very, very important that veterans and wounded soldiers get the help that they need. And at the moment, in America, there's a huge waiting list for some of the soldiers that have been wounded in the wars. Whether you agree with the wars or whether you don't agree with the wars, it's very, very important that these soldiers get the help that they need and Donald Trump has done a great deal to draw attention to that. So that was the principal reason that we issued a knighthood. Okay, great. So uh, what positive reasons... Oh, sorry. What are the positive reasons for giving Donald Trump this honour? So. Well, he's done something else for politics, you know. He's moved the whole political debate forward in many areas. And I think the most important thing that he's done is he's knocked out to a very large degree, political correctness. I don't think politics will ever be the same again. Right, okay. Uh, do you think he's going to come to the UK to accept this honour in person, or...? Well, I wouldn't be surprised after he sees this broadcast. Um, you know, it would be a great honour if he did. And I'm sure at some point, if he becomes president, he will come to the UK. And uh, I think Tintagel would be a wonderful place for him to come. Right. Uh, have you received any negative circumstances for giving Donald Trump the honour of the round table knighthood? You know, I have personally had nothing but compliments with the idea. I've had uh, uh, you know, a lot of people calling up the hotel uh, and saying this is a marvellous idea. There have been a number of news reports that um, have had conflicting uh, ideas and so on and so forth, but I personally haven't seen them. You know, and um, it, it, it is it is something that people have varying opinions on. I'm aware of that. Okay. Uh, so, how have you dealt with this criticism? Well, I think in life you have to um, go with the positive. And one of the things I've always learned is is you celebrate the positive and ignore the negative. And when one works in media, there's always going to be, in life, if ever you try and achieve something or do something positive, somebody is always going to try and knock you down or try to uh, present that that's not a good thing. And that doesn't matter. You could, you could do the most positive thing in the world. My strategy has always been just to ignore the negative and just to move on with the positive. So that's how I deal with it. That's how I deal with any criticism. Although. On this subject, personally, I have had nobody speak to me personally and say, um, this is not a good thing. Right, okay, great. So, uh, do you think Donald Trump would make a good president if he were to become president of the United States? Yeah, I do. Yeah. I do. I think he'd be great. I think he would make America great again. I think he would help the economy. And I think it would be a marvellous thing for really uh, everybody in the world. And that's why certainly we, we you know, he has our support. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, so are you going to make anyone else a knight at a round table so, uh, recently? Or? Well, we do actually have uh, a plan on that in mind, which we will let you know about if we may. Um, but if you visit our Facebook page, which is Camelot TV Network, then what you can do is, is, is we will keep you updated. But we do have a major plan for that, 
and we may even like to have your help with that because we are looking for people in Cornwall that might qualify. Right, okay, great. So how can me and Harvey become a night at the round table if, you know, do something? What, what, what qualifies to be that? Well, that is the important question. What you need to do is you need to present evidence of noble deeds. Now, what do I mean by noble deed? Basically, something that helps somebody else. And, you know, in life, obviously, what we do to help other people is really, really important. And the truth of the matter is, is that I believe that deep at heart, we're all knights in truth. I think everybody has nobility within them. I think spiritually and as human beings, we are all very, very noble people. Sometimes we don't express that as well as we might. And it seems at times that some people are more noble than others. So what, uh, what somebody needs to do to be a knight of the noble order of Camelot Castle is they need to basically have demonstrated noble deeds. And if they've demonstrated sufficient noble deeds, then they will be made a knight of the round table. Okay, great. Well, thanks for letting us interview you. Good. Thanks. Well, you're very welcome. Thank you. Good now we have a live studio interview with local artist Peter Graham, who has carved an amazing Merlin sculpture into the cliffs of Tintagel. What was your inspiration? The inspiration for the, the piece came from English Heritage. Uh, what they want to do is they want to revitalise the whole experience of going to Tintagel and as part of that what they wanted was uh, an image coming out of the rock face down at the beach. So uh, they gave me the idea, well they, they wanted the brief to do it and so I took it from there. So the inspiration came from them. So how was it working in the cliff compared to other t materials you've worked with? Well, working on the site is actually very difficult. Usually what I do is I work in a studio uh, uh, where you haven't got the rain and the tides to worry about, uh, nice calm conditions, but there you're actually working on the beach itself. Uh, if the, sh uh, the rain comes down, you've got to take shelter, you've got to hide from the, you know, the hail and things like that. So it was actually very difficult. And obviously you've got to take all your tools down there as well. So, how long did it take you to do um, the Merlin sculpture? Overall, it took over two months to do, but that was two months, um, it wasn't two months solid, because you could only get down there at certain times. So, overall, it took nine days. Nine days? Nine days in total, but that's sometimes I had to go down for half a day, and the tide would come in, so I had to get out quick before I got my feet wet. Okay, did you enjoy uh, bringing back? Um, the story of Arthur? Well, so far as I'm concerned, what I really enjoyed was bringing a face out of the stone. So Merlin comes from the Arthur story, but we don't actually know who was there at Tintagel. It might have been a Cornish wizard, it might have been Merlin, we don't know. So what I was trying to do was bring something out of the actual place. So some feeling of something who, who belonged there. Are you a big fan of um, Merlin? Oh, every, everyone likes a wizard. Yeah. Uh, and I, I, I read about Merlin from The Sword and the Stone when I was about, I read that when I was about 11 years old and loved it from then. So the idea of magicians and wizards, I think, has always been great. So did you, by doing this sculpture, did you enjoy bringing back the story of Arthur alive again? Yeah, any, I think anything which would, um, makes people in, uh, increases people's imagination or helps them imagine something else is really good and to actually get, bring something out of the cliff it was fantastic for them. So how do you feel about being accused of being um, a vandal? Being a vandal, yes there was quite a lot of that. I think when you're doing a piece of public sculpture you really can't please everyone. Uh, you haven't got to take these things personally and what people objected to wasn't actually so much the sculpture it was more the idea of carving into an actual cliff so it was the fact that it was there and you're making a change to what is a natural environment what advice would you say to these young sculptures who want to do good i think for a young sculptor what i would say was draw all the time look around you all the time 
look at what other people have done and don't worry about being good just worry about enjoying it and get as much of it as you can thank you for interviewing me pleasure, pleasure. we are going over to alex and morgan who are at nuki zoo interviewing big cat keeper john about whether or not the bodman beast could really rent the local malls <laughs> Recently published government files show UK authorities wasted thousands on an investigation in 1995 into the existence of a monstrous Cornish beast. The six, uh, the six months probe discovered the offending creature was a common domestic cat. The previous secret documents prove the beast of Bowman Moor, said to have been roaming the Cornwall wilds for almost two decades, is actually a 12-inch tall pussycat. The conclusion was reached following a far-reaching inquiry by the Ministry of Agriculture, Fisheries, Food, that cost taxpayers £84,000. Nuki Zoo, in front of the links enclosure, this is uh, John. Um, would it be possible for big cats to be living on bottom moss? Absolutely. I um, mean, cats like these lynx, uh, pumas, that sort of thing, would easily live in this country. They eat mostly rabbits and deer and things like that. The climate's perfect for them, and in fact, they're, they're looking at reintroducing lynx into into the UK. So uh, it would be more than more than adequate for those animals to live in bottom moor. Reintroducing them into the wild or into more zoos? No, into the wild. Into the wild in Scotland. It's a proposal. They haven't decided whether they're going to do it yet. But it's perfectly feasible for those to live up, up on the moor. Um, the government have spent £84,000 on an investigation on the beast of Bobby and Moss. Um, do you reckon that this big cat exists? I think um, my personal opinion is that uh, they were possibly released after the Danish Wild Animal Licence uh, was brought in, uh, but since then I would doubt very much whether there's any cats in the world in this country. Um, would the, if there were, would they have been able to survive for very long? Or? Easily. I mean, they would easily survive in the wild, eating rabbits and small deer. A certain amount of sheep, they will take uh, farmers' uh, livestock, but not very much, and only small. Um, because there's so many rabbits. If you walk through the countryside, there's rabbits and deer everywhere. There's three million deer in this country, so plenty of prey. Um, so that's quite easy, but um, the likelihood of captive animals being released into the wild, being able to adapt to the wild and uh, and then uh, breed and I mean if they were released in 1976 it would be six, seven, eight generations of cats that would have had the breed in this country and, and they've never found a body yet so I don't think much that happened. And there have been several reports of dead sheep found with claw marks to the neck. Do you reckon this could be a big cat or another animal? There, there's an awful lot of uh, speculation about this and what it actually constitutes a cat kill rather than a dog kill. Um, and the experts that have, have tracked these animals in the wild in North America um, say that just about every photograph ever taken has been a dog kill. Um, there's never any evidence whatsoever that it's cats. It's possible. I mean, but I'm, it, 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 there are possibly cats out there but without any evidence at all, ever. Will there be a risk to human life if there were big cats out there? Almost certainly not. Um, pumas in the wild have been known to attack people, but on incredibly rare occasions when there's large amounts of cats around. Uh, and there's so much prey in this country, they, it, it's not in a cat's interest to attack anybody. And these are very intelligent animals, and they're not going to attack horses, and not going to attack human beings. Um, you know, there, there is no reason for them to do that. So uh, if there isn't a reason for an animal to do something, it won't do it. Jess and Rhiannon bring us the latest on the high school one of the subjects most complained about by students at our school is the price of school food. Some people don't have the money to pay for the higher priced food and they don't have the time to compare food at home for school so they, de so they depend on the school canteen for their food. We went to our school canteen to find out why prices were so high. Okay. Okay. Where do you get the ingredients from? We get most of our ingredients locally and source locally, so um, it is good local products that we buy. What is cooked from scratch? Uh, the main meal is cooked from scratch. Uh, biscuits we cook, uh, bread rolls is cooked here. Um, the burgers um, actually, we don't actually make our own, but they, they do come, the burgers come from a 
capture locally. So, um, why do some options like pizza slices seem so expensive when they are cotton? It is because uh, we have to make a slight profit on what we sell because we have there's obviously wages to pay for, and so it's. Um, it's, it comes out in the cost of, of pizza. Have you, ever, have you had any complaints about the freedom of content? Uh, no, we don't seem to have any complaints. What do you think about making this for prices lower? Um, well, that, that would be down to the powers that be, because obviously they have to pay us, and there is a small profit to come out of that as well. So, although I I mean, they don't make a lot of profit. It is mainly to cover the cost of the food and our wages for doing it. Do you think the prices are fair for the quality and quantity? Uh, no, pizza's, uh, a slice of pizza is £1.10 and you can just buy a um, big pizza for £3. Which products do you think are overpriced? Um, Panini's pastas, pasta and pizzas because you don't get a lot in pasta and the quality the quality um, isn't very good. How does this affect students? Um, it's expensive for people that haven't got a lot of money and food and for free school meals they don't get a lot and it's just not. We are now on the road with Harry and Keelan who are interviewing young drivers about the high cost of car insurance for new drivers. Do you have any ideas on why car insurance is so high? Um, I believe it's just to protect sort of younger drivers because they are more liable to crashes yeah. and hence, you know, it's more expensive because it's more likely that it will be in an accident or something will happen to them. How can they change this much for car insurance? Uh, just for the pure fact that young drivers are more likely to crash, so, you know, it's less of a problem if they do. Why is it just for, teen, uh, for your teen years? Um, I think personally it's because sort of you, you sort of learn to drive more after you pass your test. So by the time you're about 20, 21, you're a lot more experienced. So the risk of you crashing is a lot less likely. Yeah. What does your car insurance achieve? Well, uh, if you crash your car, you're covered. Uh, you don't have to fork out for a new car repairs if it is a serious accident. Uh, it basically just makes you feel safer driving. Yeah. Is it hard to pay for car insurance? Um, it is a bit of a setback. I mean, I personally pay monthly, um, but it's not too bad. I mean, I have a job, so but if I didn't, I would struggle. Yeah. Do you know when your car insurance price will drop? Uh, it's usually after your first year. So what you do is you drive for a year. If everything's all right, then you'll they'll usually almost half your price. Does your car uh, vary car price, uh, insurance prices? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, the, a lot of things, sort of like the car itself, how much it's done, sort of mileage wise, and yeah, it is, every car is completely different. Do you think car insurance is fair? It depends which car you get again, because I know John, he's got a older car and he has to pay a lot for insurance, whereas I've got a newer one, so yeah. my parents chose that car because it is low to insure, so I don't really have a problem with it. Thank you for answering the questions. There has been 33 cases of scarlet fever recorded in the UK in recent months. Callum, Josh and Alfie has the latest on this story. There has been a recent outbreak of scarlet fever in the UK. Why do you think there has been 33 new cases this year? I can't answer that. I really don't know why. They're, I don't even know if that's more cases than we'd normally expect. I know over the past few years the numbers have doubled, but what we'd expect in the middle of March for in terms of cases, I'm not sure. Um, clearly, it's a bacterial infection, so the bacteria are spreading in some way, but most of the time people can easily be cured from it, so yeah, I'm not sure to answer that really. What are the symptoms of scarlet fever? Um, first of all, quite mild. So you, uh, you would have a sore throat, um, you might have a headache, 
a fever, quite a high fever, so over 38 degrees centigrade Celsius, which is normally to one and a half degrees Celsius higher than we'd expect for a normal body temperature. And then you can start to have a sort of reddish, pinky uh, rash coming out, and eventually you almost get, it's like sunburn, but you can feel, it's almost like sandpaper in the feel afterwards. Do you know what I mean by sandpaper? If you're touching sandpaper, the skin has little bobbles on it, like uh, sandpaper. Um, on the face, you don't get the spots like that, but you get, you can be quite flushed on the face, but often whiter around the mouth, and there's a way to look, when you look at the rash, if you put a glass on the rash, your skin will go white underneath as well. Uh, why are there more cases at the moment? Again, that comes back to the first question a little bit. I'm not sure. There definitely are, in terms of, not this year, but in terms of the last four or five years, we have seen the numbers double. But I think it's about 6,000 a year. It was about 3,000 a year before. So we're not in the middle of a massive outbreak, but obviously that's concerning that the numbers are increasing like that. What are the effects of the disease? The effects of the disease longer term shouldn't be too serious. You should be able to recover quite easily. So uh, not all, but most diseases that we know from childhood diseases and coughs and colds, chickenpox, those sorts of things, will either be caused by viruses or bacteria. This is a bacterial infection. The nice thing about bacterial infection is that unless there's antibiotic resistance, if you give somebody antibiotics, it should clear it up, and that's the case with this. Uh, it's caused by a bacteria called Streptococcus, which is also the bacteria that causes impetigo. Have you heard of impetigo? So impetigo is a nasty skin infection, and the bacteria is everywhere really, but it's very capable of being transmitted from one person to another. So touch, definitely even breathing in droplets if you have coughs or colds. But actually, if, imagine at home someone had it, a brother or sister, if you shared a towel with them, then that could uh, spread the, the transmission as well. Tends to be younger children though. I think 80% of cases would be in children under the age of 10 years old. So it tends to be in children, tends to clear up very quickly and easily with antibiotics. What would stop it from spreading further? Um, Probably the biggest single thing in preventing it spreading is that when someone has it, they stay away from work or off school, because it's probably going to be school, because as I've said, so many of the cases are children, um, and wait until at least 24 hours after you've taken the antibiotics before coming back to school. Um, antibiotics are usually given for 10 days, but one of the problems that we have often with antibiotics is that people who take the antibiotics start to feel better and the symptoms start to disappear. So imagine after you've taken your antibiotics five days afterwards, your symptoms have gone and you feel completely fine. There's a temptation to stop taking the antibiotics. You must, must, must take the antibiotics to the end of the bottle, the course, whatever it, form it's happening in. So I think that's important as well. Could it be fatal? Um, usually no. In special circumstances, Perhaps if someone had a really weakened immune system, imagine somebody had HIV and had gone into full-blown AIDS and they didn't have a strong immune system, you can imagine a case like that. If ever we had, God forbid, a situation where the bacteria became uh, resistant to antibiotics and someone was run down, that's a possibility. But in 99.99% of the cases, no, absolutely not. Now we go over to Jacob and Jake, who are investigating why there have been a rise of dead people using Facebook. Facebook has over 1 billion users, and yet more than 10,000 of them die every day. So if we crunch the numbers, how long do you think it will take before accounts belonging to the dead outnumber those of the living? Believe it or not, 30 million Facebook users die in the first 8 years of its existence. In fact, 4 in 28 of them die every hour. So so they're partially dropping like flies, and every day these dormant accounts receive friend requests, getting tagged in photos, and sometimes they're even wished a happy birthday. Tyler, do you think people would keep their Facebook 
after they've died? Uh, I think they should keep, well, no, I don't think they should keep their Facebook accounts because, uh, well, it's just taking up space on the internet, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think they should just be deleted instantly. I think maybe the family should have some time to get the photos off Facebook and, you know, just then after that, after, you know, they've got their photos, after they've, you know, gotten over it, uh, they can delete the account. So, you know, don't want to take space up on the internet for, like, millions, like, even if Facebook's really popular, billions of people possibly dying and, like, just having useless Facebook accounts. So, yeah, I, think, I do think they should be deleted. Right. Joey, what, what do you think? I think that you should keep your account because it's quite a nice thing if you get wished a happy birthday for your loved ones and family to wish you a happy birthday when you're gone and for them to access your photos anytime they need to and it's just like a privilege of having Facebook to for someone to do that like they can look at times and memories all of that. Now for the sports over to our sport team Alfie, Callum and Josh. Hello today we are interviewing Brett at a year 13 academy rugby star. What were your reactions when you got told that you had been picked for the team? When my coach first told me I was picked for the team I was pretty surprised because this was my first season playing rugby and I'm pretty new to it but he clearly saw potential. What made you start playing rugby? Well, the majority of my friends started playing rugby several years ago and I was playing football but I wanted to play a more physical sport and they suggested to come try it out. So I did and then I ended up really enjoying it. So how long have you been playing rugby for and um, did you think you would get to where you are now? Well I started playing rugby last year for a little bit but an injury put me out for a while but I never really thought I would get to the first team of the academy. I thought I would always start on the bench but I always start for the team now. Who inspired you to start playing rugby? Probably my new coach Ian because he had done so well with the rugby academy compared to previous years that the college has participated in the league. What was your best game you played and why? Our best game was last Wednesday when we played Truro first and second team. I would probably say that's my personal favourite game because the whole team gelled together really well and we, although we didn't win the game, we really played well together as a team. Has rugby always been your favourite sport? I wouldn't say it would always be my favourite sport as I used to be into my football a lot but now I would definitely say rugby's took my top spot. How many injuries have you sustained while playing rugby? I've only ever cut the top of my eye open and that is literally it. What have been your best moments while playing rugby? I would probably say my best moment was last game when I made a 50 metre run across the pitch with my whole team behind me. Thank you for talking moment. to us and we hope you have a Next up is the weather one. report of James and Sean. Welcome to the local weather report. We are looking at a nice dry start to the day on Thursday with sunshine and patchy cloud. Unfortunately, wind and heavy showers are moving in throughout the evening. In terms of air temperature, we're looking at a maximum of about 8 degrees because of northerly wind. So expect it to be a bit chilly out there. For all you surfers out there, the forecast is looking good. North for the north coast with three to five foot waves and a strong onshore wind. The south coast will be flat however so head to the north for good, the good waves back to the studio. Thank you James and Sean that bring us to the end of BBC School Report. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed our new show. Goodbye.